I, I forgot my keys with my bike lock. Is it okay if I just put it up there? I just don't want to get stolen. Doesn't bother me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, folks, let's get started. How's everybody doing today? End of the day, last class of the day. This is always good, right? So after this, you can go back and go to sleep. But this period of the, the, the day, nobody should be asleep, right? This is a good, it's a good time to be wide awake. It's happy hour, right? Okay, so um, obviously I haven't scared all of you off, so um, I'll see what I can do today to do something about that. Uh, last time I pointed out that I have a web page, and there was some confusion. I had a couple people uh, contact me, and they were confused about having a web page versus a Blackboard page. I have both. The Blackboard site has only PowerPoints, okay? Only the PowerPoints. The web page has everything else. So there's the URL that you need to find the web page. If you don't go, and I sent an email out to everybody today uh, announcing that, but if you don't go to this URL, you're not going to find this material. It's not on Blackboard. The only stuff on Blackboard is or are the PowerPoints, that is the figures for the, for the, the course. Right? So you've got to go to this uh, site to get everything else. Last night, um, and usually it takes me about 24 hours, uh, I posted uh, online the uh, first video. So if you scroll down, you can see, uh, for example, that I posted highlights. Okay, And there weren't very many. Um, I posted videos. Okay, so you can either get it as a full res resolution video here, and if you want to watch it in a high quality mode, you can do that. Doink. Okay, fill the screen so you can actually see the stuff pretty well. Except for the ugly guy that's there, it's a pretty good video. And okay, and you can download them if you want to. Uh, put them on your iPod, iPhone, etc., and watch them. So or listen to them. There's also MP3s there as well. So take advantage of those. I put them up there. They're a lot of work, let me tell you that. Uh, to put one of these guys together, it's about two hours worth of work every day. That's why I want to make sure you're benefiting from them and not just not coming to class, right? If I'm putting the effort into it, I want to see you guys putting the effort into it too. I'm sure you will. OK, so um, we're ready to dive into the deep end. And when we dive into the deep end, we dive into water, hopefully. Because if we don't dive into water, we're going to hit the bottom of the pool and it's very hard down there. So we're going to talk about water as the very first thing in talking about biochemistry. All right? So a lot of what I'm going to say today you saw in general chemistry. And I hope that what I tell you about water and about pH and so forth makes more sense to you than it made in general chemistry. Okay? Now, I don't want to complain too much about chemistry, but in my experience, they don't do a very good job of teaching people about pH and buffers and water and solutions. Okay? And I don't like to just get up here and complain, but I've got done this enough year, I've done this for long enough that I've seen that students really are coming out of their general chemistry classes with that information not very solid. So I hope to make it solid with you. My aim in going through this is not to give you something to do a whole bunch of calculations with. Okay? Uh, because of course I could do that. We will do some calculations on it, and you'll see some problems that I recommend. And I'm not going to go through the problems in the class. If you have questions about the problems, and you very well may, please come see me. That's what they pay me to do. And if you come see me, I can step you through things, I can talk you through things, and hopefully uh, make some sense of this stuff for you, in addition to what I'm going to say today. Okay? So I'm going to start fairly basic. Um, without water, we do not have life. At least we do not have life on Earth. Water is essential for everything that we know about life on Earth. No ifs, ands, ors, or buts about it. There's no system on Earth that exists without water. And when we look for life elsewhere in the universe, elsewhere in the solar system, the first place that we look is water because the only kind of life that we know how to look for involves water. So that tells us it's pretty important. We all hear the statistic. 70% of our bodies is comprised of water. And I learned a statistic myself as I was uh, preparing for the class that I wasn't aware of. It's always important for me to learn things as well as uh, you guys learning things. And I'll pass on what I learned uh, as well to you. One of the things I learned is that the composition of water in your body varies with your age, 
with your sex and with your level of obesity. Did you know that? I didn't know it. And the levels vary from a high of uh, about 79% for a very athletic person. Okay, Very athletic people tend to have more water because they have to be able to sweat and so forth, and they build up those stores of water. Females tend to have more water than males do. You don't need to know this. I'm just giving you some facts. Okay, And people who are heavier, the very obese people may have as little as 40% water in their bodies. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay, um, So uh, the water content of bodies fluctuates. We don't see any bodies, of course, that don't have water because everything in the cells is dissolved in water. We're going to be talking about enzymes. Enzymes are dissolved in water. We're going to be talking about glucose and sugar, and they're dissolved in water. So without water, we don't have these things, and we need these things, of course, for energy. We need to have these things for genetic information, if we're talking about DNA and RNA. And we need to have these things for catalyzing reactions, if we're talking about enzymes. So water, I hope I convince you, is a very, very important substance. Well, you learn various facts in uh, chemistry. And here's some facts, OK? We're not going to memorize these facts. I show you these facts to illustrate a point to you. What do they teach you in general chemistry about electronegativity? What do they tell you? OK, it increases as you go right up. What do they tell you it was? OK, so it's a tendency of, an, of a, a, a nucleus to attract electrons to itself. Something that has a high electronegativity has a high affinity. It pulls the electrons closer to itself than something that has a low electronegativity. OK? And hopefully you, you got those in your general chemistry class. Now, um, when we compare the electronegativities of atoms that we commonly find in living cells, we see there are some differences. Water has an electronegativity of 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Now, you don't need to memorize those numbers, but you should know that those numbers are reasonably far apart from each other. Now, based on what I've just told you, what that should tell you is if we have a water molecule that has H2O, that the electrons are going to be held closer to the oxygen than they're going to be held to the hydrogen, to each hydrogen. OK? Well, if we think about this in terms of sharing and so forth, the oxygen is electron rich, and the hydrogens are electron poor. When things gain electrons, they become more negative. And when things lose electrons, they become more positive. Well, they don't completely give them up. So it's not like hydrogen is completely giving up its electron, and oxygen is completely taking its electron. In fact, we have a sharing that's going on. It's an uneven sharing. Love the noise. Uh, it's an uneven sharing, OK? But it's a sharing nonetheless. So the oxygen is holding those electrons tight. We can think of the oxygen as being more negative. We, get, we call it a partial negative charge. And we can think of the hydrogens as being more positive. Well, that sets up a very, very interesting dynamic. And it sets it up for a couple of reasons. So let me tell you about those reasons. Water is a bent molecule. Okay, Water is a bent molecule. That bentness of water gives it, in addition to the differences in electronegativity, gives water portions of it that are positive. So we can think of the left side of this guy being more positive. And we can think of the right side of this guy being more negative, if we think about it as in terms of left and right. There's a sidedness to it. What if we had, what if it wasn't a bent molecule? What if we had water such that hydrogen was here, oxygen was here, hydrogen was down here? We wouldn't have as much polarity. That is, we wouldn't have as much difference of charge, because we would have a symmetric molecule, and it would be sort of balanced out in the middle. So this bentness contributes to the difference in charge of water. This difference in charge of water is absolutely essential for life. Okay, If you want one little tiny fact, that's it right there. Without this, we don't have life. 
the bentness of water and the hydrogen bonds enable probably 90% of what we're going to be talking about this term to happen. Okay, this is pretty cool. Now, because this is bent, we're only looking at one water molecule. We know, of course, that if we have another water molecule that's sitting over here, it's going to arrange itself so that opposites attract. So one of the hydrogens is going to point itself towards this oxygen, right? Because it's going to be partially positive attracted to the partial negative. And then the negative oxygen over here will be attracted to another, attracted to another, attracted to another. So we can imagine that in a, a solution of water, we've got billions, trillions, gazillions of these sorts of interactions. These interactions I just described to you are what are called hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are absolutely essential for life. Now, let's distinguish what a hydrogen bond is compared to the bonds that you see on the screen. The bonds that you see on the screen are covalent bonds. Whenever we have a sharing of electrons, even if it's not very even, whenever we have a sharing of electrons, we have a covalent bond. When we have a hydrogen bond, it's between different molecules. Different molecules. So it takes a separate water over here for it to have a hydrogen bond with this guy. I can't have a hydrogen bond within a water. I can only have a hydrogen bond between waters. Everybody got that? OK. Now, um, don't worry about the numbers, memorizing numbers. There. I keep going back here. Memorizing numbers doesn't really tell you anything. Memor understanding principles tells us much, much more. Here's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is kind of like that theoretical water molecule that I described to you that was linear. Okay? When we look at carbon dioxide, we see that it's not very polar. The, negative, the positive charge is concentrated in the middle. The negative charges are on the outside, but we don't have the same sorts of interactions. We have to position things exactly right in order to have any kind of uh, a, a charge interaction between these guys. Okay? So linear molecules don't do it nearly, nearly as well as bent molecules. Plus, if you recall back to the numbers, I'll show you the numbers. If we recall back to the numbers, what we see is that the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5. The electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5. They're not as different as hydrogen and oxygen, for example. OK. Now. Because water makes hydrogen bonds, it causes the solution to have certain properties. And those certain properties allow it to, what we think of as, dissolve things. Well, it turns out water doesn't dissolve everything. If I take uh, vegetable oil and I pour it into water, I don't see that water dissolves the oil. In fact, what I see is that I have two separate layers. If I take, on the other hand, table salt and I put it into the water, I, dis I discover that water dissolves the table salt. Why does water dissolve table salt and not dissolve the, the oil that's there? The reason is because table salt is an ionic compound. There's very little sharing of the electrons. Chlorine essentially takes uh, sodium's electrons away. So we can think of these guys in the crystalline form as being minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, et cetera, et cetera. We've got charges. Here, we've got partial charges out here. These partial charges now can start peeling off these guys one at a time. We see the oxygen here interacting with this sodium. It's going to peel it off. We see this, um, these two hydrogens here interacting with this chlorine. It's going to peel it off. And when it peels it off, it takes it out into solution, and it surrounds it in a nice little cage that's actually three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, as you see here. So the property of water is that it will dissolve ionic compounds. It will dissolve compounds that have an abundance of hydrogen bonds as well. It doesn't have to be ionic. And I'll show you some examples for that. <clears throat> Why doesn't it dissolve oil? Oil doesn't have any ions. And oil doesn't have hardly anything that it can hydrogen bond to. There's no way for these partial charges.